So this talk is about clearing up some misconceptions about what Emacs actually is, because when I said I wanted to, to do a talk about Emacs, I got this fairly familiar response. It's an operating system. And, you know, the other thing people say is it's an operating system lacking only a decent text editor, but both of those things are wrong. So it's not an operating system because you still need a kernel and an init system to use it. For now, we're working on that. And does it lack a decent text editor? Well, there's an implementation of Vim, which is the best text editor ever, so obviously it's not that either. So what is it? Emacs is, well, it is a text editor, really, but the way it's implemented is sort of relevant to explaining it. There's two main code bases, the C and the Lisp code. The C code is the core, which implements the really basic functionality like managing buffers. So that's just an object in memory, usually some text. So you can see it's a PDF here, but there's also some text that's also a buffer. And manipulating text. But in the C, that's the most basic things like inserting and deleting characters. And window management, you just saw I split the screen in two. And the big one, evaluating all the Lisp code, which makes up most of Emacs. And because the Lisp, it, it's, the thing is, the Lisp code makes up the majority of Emacs and it has complete control over everything that happens. So it's more useful to think about what you can make in Emacs. And I think this is why people say it's an operating system because the limits are pretty much your imagination and the single thread that Emacs Lisp runs on. So I'd like to make the comparison to a web browser. Why? Well, they're both controlled with a shoddy dynamically typed scripting language. Emacs Lisp is sort of a cheap knockoff of Common Lisp. Um, I think it's, it's older, but no. And both have a focus on rendering documents of some kind. So in uh, a web browser, that would be like an HTML document. And in Emacs, that's usually going to be a plain text file, maybe in a programming language. And as I said, you can make pretty much any application in them. So people have written email clients, note-taking software, document processing applications, PDF viewers, you can see this is, e this is Emacs right now, and games in Emacs, and even another funny thing, you can get a text editor that runs in your browser. This is VS Code, just you, you open this and it's just a subset of but VS Code in the browser. And people have also written web browsers that run inside Emacs. So it's this circular thing. And what else? One particular application I want to mention is org mode. Uh, at the most basic level, it's a markup syntax sort of like markdown. You can see you can do, you can do headings and bold and italic text. And, and some Emacs people will even have readme.org instead of readme.md in their GitHub projects. And GitHub can actually render this because it's pretty much just a one-to-one -one mapping to uh, markdown at the most basic level. And you might think, why would I bother with this instead of using markdown? But org mode is so much more than that. It's a fully featured note-taking system, more like Obsidian. It's also got uh, features for project management. So you can have a list of to-do items and when you've got to get things done. And it also supports literate programming. So you can have a source code block in, inside a org mode document, and then you can run that and have the result output in the file, which is sort of like Jupyter if you've used that. And even, as I mentioned on the previous slide, you have support for uh, formatting documents like, a, like in LaTeX or something. And this presentation was written in org mode. This is the top of the file right here. And all of this power comes from Lisp code, so how does that work? Now, Lisp is actually very simple. It's pretty much just an abstract syntax tree where you have a uh, node is kind of just this parenthesized expression. And so it's got one, two, three elements. And the way, you eva way Lisp code evaluates is the first element in this expression is function, which gets applied to these arguments. So this creates variable A, which is a linked list containing the elements one, two, three. Lisp, Lisp stands for list processing. So the most basic operations are getting the head and tail of the list and constructing a new node. And a bigger example looks like this. The weird parts will be the prefix syntax for the less than sign and the minus sign. That's because Lisp is so simple, it doesn't even have infix operators. But it's 
it does what you'd expect. Minus n1 is n minus 1. In fact, there's even a built-in function 1 minus, which just does min minus 1, because that's so common that you're going to want it anyway. Um, and you can see it's recursive. It's, you can do functional programming in Lisp. It's not strictly a functional language, but it's got functional operators you'd expect, like mapping and first class functions. And this is actually the literate programming I mentioned. If I open the source code file for this, uh, you can see map car. You can see I've not got the actual list in the source code. This was generated at compile time. So since Emacs and Emacs Lisp have this whole programming environment that only exists for extending Emacs, you need to have a way of, ma package, of managing packages and uh, things like that. So the built-in Emacs package manager uh, is a place where you can download uh, all the extensions you'd expect in a normal editor, like um, integration with development tools and uh, support for file types. But you also get packages which are just code libraries, like Dash here, which doesn't provide any user-facing functionality, but just a set of functions for, in this case, operating on lists. And you can see it wasn't installed explicitly. It was a dependency from these other packages. And you'll see some of these packages are called uh, Jai mode, Haskell mode. What's that? Modes are how, you, how Emacs implements most of the user-facing functionality. So they're sort of fun they are functions to some extent. What they do is a mode will set some configuration options uh, which affect how Emacs behaves. It, either in a certain buffer or at the level of the whole editor. And there are two main types, major and minor modes. Major modes, you have exactly one per buffer, that if you've got a C file, then the buffer's major mode is C mode. But they're not like just for file types. Any, anything you can do in Emacs is in a buffer. So if I've got a shell here, then that's in shell mode. And if I wanted to edit my mail in Emacs, that would be in mail mode. And this is actually a useful thing to do because you have the same set of editing commands and like the user interface for all of these different ways of, all of these different applications. So that may not be so impressive with the default Emacs key bindings, but if you had something like a Vim keys plugin, then you'd have Vim keys in your shell and your email client. And major modes, since you can only have one in each buffer, but you, you have a lot of common behavior between them, they operate on a inheritance model where you have, for example, fundamental mode, which is just for editing plain text, then prog mode for like anything that's a programming language, and then C mode, which is for C specifically. And then for buffers which don't have plain text, you have special mode and PDF view mode, which is how I'm presenting this presentation is derived from that. Now, minor modes are for secondary functionality, and this can be anything, including key bindings or uh, line numbers. As I said, key bindings, evil mode, BIM, best editor ever, and also for automatically inserting line breaks while you're typing a paragraph, for example. You also get uh, stuff like spell checkers as minor, mo minor modes. Now, when you open a file, Emacs will look at the extension to determine the major mode. But if you want to automatically enable minor modes in a certain uh, context, then you can use hooks. So you can say, so for every mode, there's a hook. And, the, and there's the add hook function, which says, when this mode gets activated, run this function. Because as I said, modes are just functions. So this will say, in any buffer that's a major mode derived from prog mode, turn on line numbers. So you can see I don't have line numbers here. But again, if I go back to this file, I've got line numbers. And here's a major mode file I wrote uh, for a random domain specific language, which was so obscure it didn't have one yet. And you can see it's pretty much just setting some variables like what the mode's called, what the format is for comments, and, uh, and regular expressions for how the 
uh, how the code should be highlighted. And you can see here is an example of code that's written in that mode. Um, and another thing, this syntax highlighting was generated by Emacs. This, uh, well, ignore this. I didn't load the mode file, actually. I can do that live. So I vote it in this file, which I'll just open up. So yeah, there's the whole file, and I can evaluate the buffer like that. And then I'll have it there. So I can go back to my source code file, and I'm taking a big visc here. It's now syntax highlighted in the source code, and I can recompile the PDF, and it'll still be there, hopefully. Yeah, nothing changed. Don't be too impressed, but um, let's see. What else can I talk about? Oh, yeah, I was going to show off some other cool stuff. So we've got Pong in here. Oh, there we go. I don't know how to control the left paddle. It might be AI or something. And Tetris. It's just Tetris. Why not? Thank you. Any questions? <laughs>